So we're going to do more Laplace PDE, but with uh, more boundary conditions. Okay? More boundary conditions. Uh -huh. But before we do this, uh, let me uh, do some investigation onto uh, what are some basic functions that satisfy the Laplace equation. So, um, so question here: What values should coefficients be for u x y equals to say a x squared plus b x y plus c y squared. Notice that for x and y, these are all the second order polynomials you can write. Right? This is order two. Right? This is order one. Order one. One plus one is two. That's order two. So for second order polynomials, you can only write this or this or this. So that's all the possible second order polynomials you can write. And then plus, let's now write down all the uh, first order. So dx plus ey. That's everything, right? You can't, you don't have anything else. And then the constant. So for this equation to satisfy uxx plus uyy equal to zero. Let's ask this simple question. Okay. Uh, so for this one, We can just do the calculation. Okay, so what is uxx? All right, first, what is ux? Let's do that first. What is ux? ax squared, if you differentiate by x, is 2ax. If you do a partial derivative with respect to x, that's just by. Now, y is treated as a constant, so what do you get if you differentiate this? Zero. This will be d, and everything else will be zero. So that's what we have. And then uh, uxx would be just uh, 2a. That's all, right? That's, that's it. Now let's do uyy then. So it looks like only the y squared will survive. Everything else, if you do two derivatives, they're going to disappear because look at what happened to, to uxx. Only x squared survived, right? And it became 2a. If you take ax squared, you differentiate by x twice, you get 2a. That's because everything else has x order 1 or less. So if you differentiate twice, eventually it becomes 0, right? Okay? So x differentiates to 1, and 1 differentiates to 0. Okay. So uyy should be what? What do you think? Oops. 2c. Right. Yeah. If you differentiate this by, by y twice, it would be 2c. So uxx plus uyy equals to 0 would simply mean that 2a plus 2c equals to 0, which means that c must be equal to negative a. Right? So the answer is uxy, let's just replace this by negative a and combine these two so that this is a times x squared minus y squared plus b times xy and then the other one, dx plus ey plus f. So that's what we have. Now, you could play the same game for higher order as well. 
Do you agree? Right. So, so you could have like put all the third power if you wanted. So, uh, we could also try a x cubed b x squared y c. Uh, what do you think? C what? X, Y squared plus D, Y cubed. That will be all the third order, right? Yeah. We can, we, we can put this into there and figure out what kind of relationship A, B, C, D would have, right? Then, then you're going to get some more. And so on and so on, okay? Uh, so what, what does this tell us? Well, first of all, uh, just the solution itself is quite interesting because it tells you what kind of quadratic surfaces satisfy the, the uh, Laplace PDE and x and y, what, what are the, the graphs of y, uh, z equal to x? This is a two variable function so if you want the graph in 3D you need to say z is equal to this. So z is equal to x for example, what kind of graph is that? Oh, it's like linear? It's uh, in, in 3D if you drew the graph of z equals to, let's say, dx plus ey plus f, what would this be? That, that's a plane in 3D. You knew that. Come on, let's say you know that, okay? That's a plane, right? That's a, that's a plane in 3D, yeah? Okay, um, how about z equals to xy? What kind of graph is that one? That one's slightly trickier, but uh, somebody did tell me what kind of surface this is. Uh, all right, let me, let me try to draw. Okay, so uh, if if you say, let's look at the level curves. If you say zero is equal to x y, what's that? That means either x is zero or y is zero. So on the xy plane, x equal to zero is this this one, y equal to zero is this one. So that that's that's zero. Now if you put one as your level curve, that means y is equal to one over x. What's the graph of one over x? This one and that one, right? So that's one and one. If you put two equals to xy, it's going to give you two here, two there, right? How about if you plug in negative one? There's y, uh, that gives you y equals to negative one over x, so that, that's actually uh, the other direction. So let's see. Negative one here, negative one here. Okay. And then if you put negative two, it's going to be negative two here, negative two. Um, to imagine this surface, imagine that you are a person living on this terrain. Okay? Now, you're going this way. What's happening? Are you going uphill or downhill? Uphill. uphill. It's, the, the level is going up, right? Okay. Now, if you're going this way, what's happening? Going down. Yeah, so if, you, if we think of zero as the sea level, this is water. Okay. You're, you're going down, down and down and down below water. Okay. Oh, so drawing. we're going to set Huh? So it is a saddle? It is a saddle, yes, yes. That's what I'm trying to say. This is indeed a saddle. Okay. Uh, how about uh, z equals to x squared minus y squared? Well, um, this one, it's like if z is equal to 0, you get these two. Okay. That's, that's because if 0 is equal to x squared minus y squared, that factors as x plus y times x minus y. And you solve that, you get y equals to x and y equals to negative x, so you get 0 here and there. Okay. Now, if, if z is 1, what kind of graph is this one? Right, right. So, so if you plug in 0, you get two values of x. You get x as 1 and negative 1, right? So you get 1 here and you get negative 1. And then you plug in uh, 
some other places, and you will see that the graph is like this. That's level one. And then here you get level two. Here you get negative one, here you get negative two, negative one, negative two. So what is that? Saddle again. Again, saddle. It's just that it's actually exactly the same as this graph, just, just rotated at 45 degrees. Okay. That's again a saddle. Okay. So uh, what we see is that uh, a, a typical type of graph, oh, by the way, I, I should have said something uh, about the, the, this, this U. Uh, so maybe I should say here. A function U satisfying uh, you remember this short shorthand for uxx plus uyy? Okay. So this, this is just a shorthand for, for uxx plus uyy. Okay. If this is equal to zero, uh, is called harmonic. Okay. A function is harmonic if it's a solution to the Laplace equation. And a typical kind of Laplace equation solutions are these saddles. It looks like this, it looks like this, it could also be flat, flat, or flat planes. It could be slanted flat planes. Those are harmonic functions. And of course you have uh, more complex type of functions or you can have like exponential functions. Or you can have all kinds. Okay? But what's really true is that locally if you look at what's happening because their trace of the, this, I explained that this is a trace of the, the uh, uh, is it, her, no, uh, Hessian, yeah, it's a trace of the Hessian, uh, which is, it tells you how concave something is, but it says if one side is concave up, the other side has to be concave down, right? So that means locally it always has to look like a saddle. That's what it means. So that, that's why obviously it has to be these. So it gives you some important pr prototypes. It gives you some idea of what the shape might look like. Okay. Now back to another boundary value problem. yesterday, uh, but I think I, I didn't explain clearly what to do with these boundary conditions. So uh, let me explain that again today. So suppose you have uxx plus uyy equal to zero on some domain of, like this is x and that's y, and let's just say that uh, it's width is l and M. Okay. So that there are four kinds of boundary conditions you can put. So you could have a function here, function here, function here, and function here. Or you could uh, write the numbers in a different way if you don't like the way I numbered it. That's not the point, but let's just say you have some, some function some values here. And I'm, I'm saying function because it doesn't have to be a constant value like how the example that we did last time. It could be a function of x or y. Like this, this one changes with respect to x, so it could be a function of x. This one has to be a function of y because it's only changing in the y direction and so on and so on. Okay? It, could, it could be functions there. So how would you write down the, the boundary conditions for that case? You have u of what? u of uh, x comma 0. Which one is that? Is it f1, f2, f3, f4? Which one is that? F0, f4. Uh, the, the y coordinate is 0, right? Which one has y coordinate 0? f1, f1 right? So that's f1. So obviously it must be a function of x, right? And then u of x, L, no, no, uh, u of x, uh, M would be what? Which one? X2. 
F3, yes, F3 of x, okay? And then you have also u of 0 of y, what would that be? F4. F4, good. And it must be a function of? Y. y. And you have u of L of y, which is a function of? Y and F2, right? So, suppose you have such a such a differential equation with boundary value problem. Then, uh, trying to satisfy all boundary conditions at once is very tough. Okay, so when you have such a problem, you can actually split this into four kinds of problems. So one is u one x x plus u one y y equals to 0, and u1 x0 is equal to f1x, but u1 xm would be 0, u1 0y would be 0, and u1 ly would be 0 as well. That's u1. And then, let's just write this as a Laplacian of u1. That's, that's a lot easier. Okay. That's less, less confusing. If I see a mix of 1 and xx, that's really confusing, right? And then you can have Laplacian of u2 equals to 0. And again, this time it will be all 0 except the f2. Okay, same, same values, but, but uh, uh, this will be, this value will be f2, the other ones will be 0. Yeah. And then u3 would be 0 with uh, 0 and then f3 and then 0, 0 here. u4 would be 0 with 0, 0, f4, 0. Okay. Now I believe uh, I did an example where uh, where which one did I do? Uh, I think it was this one that I did on Monday this type where it was 0, 0, 0 and this was a non-zero function okay? and that value was something I, I don't remember and then in the homework I gave the problem of this type where it was 0, 0, 0 and then something of y and the, the difference between these two is just x and y is flipped okay? so you, you look at the solution for this anytime you see an x just change it to y uh, you see a y change it to x, then you have a solution for such a thing. So it's not very different. Th these, these two, th this one and this one is slightly different, but not that different. Uh, we're going to do one like that today. Okay. But my point is this. How would you get u if I know u1, u2, u3, and u4? Well, how would you do it? Suppose I solve these four questions. How would you come up with the u? What do you think? Add. add them up, right? You add them up. Because all of these conditions are like, uh, uh, the first of all, Laplace uh, equation is linear. So if you take the Laplacian of u, that's just Laplacian of u1 plus Laplacian of u2 plus Laplacian of u3. Laplacian of u4, and all of these are 0, so it must be 0. So this summation will satisfy the Laplacian, and the summation function, the u function, will satisfy the boundary condition as this plus this plus this plus this, which will be same as this one, right? So you, you can see how the summation will, will satisfy all, all of these individual ones, right? Okay. So that's, that's how we, we solve uh, Laplace equation in general. So uh, on the exam, uh, don't be surprised if you see not just a single side non-zero, but maybe two sides non-zero. Then uh, you, you may have to split that into two two separate equations and solve them separately and then put them back. Okay, so that could happen. Okay. okay. So knowing that. 
Let's now come up with a specific problem. And uh, let me put something like uh, one side as two, the other side as four. And for these functions, so, so here's an example. So let's say this one is 4y and this one is 8x okay. and then I'm going to put uh, 1 and 2. Whew, that looks really hard. Okay. Oh, oh no, no, I, I, I need this to be zero, zero, sorry. I was too ambitious. Yeah. Trying to, to have all, all that, that, that's just too ambitious. All right, so, so let's say we want to solve this. Okay. Right. So first, we have to solve how many questions now? Three. Three, right? You have to solve one for zero for the other ones, but not zero here, and so on and so on. But that's too much work, right? Do you think there could be an easier way? Here. So what is a u x zero? That's like plugging zero into y, right? This ax squared plus dx plus f. And I need it to be 0. Okay, u of x2 would be ax squared minus 4 plus 2bx plus dx plus 2e plus f. Okay, and then u of 0y would be uh, 0 in there, so it's a times negative y squared. Okay, and then plus 0, plus 0, plus ey, plus f. Then u of 4y would give you um, 4, 6, 16 minus y squared a plus uh, 4bx plus the um, no, 4by, sorry, 4by, right? And then uh, 4d plus uh, E Y plus F. All right, so that still looks confusing, but I, I do know that I want this to be zero. I don't like those. That y squares or x squared, they never show up on the boundary, so I don't like them. Get rid of them. Now, uh, if magically you can set you can satisfy all of those using that, then you don't have to do anything, you're done. Why? Because uh, we know that if the solution exists, it's unique. Okay. I keep saying that without showing you the proof. Uh, I'll try to find some time to show you uh, some examples of uniqueness. Okay? You, can, you can prove that. Okay? So it would be wonderful if uh, indeed we can find uh, db and all that to, to make it work. But see, in differential equations, the equality is equality between functions. Okay, so here, uh, it's not, for some value of y, this is equal to 2. This has to be true for all value of y, where y is between 0 to, to 2. Okay, so these two have to be equal as functions. So for this to equal to 2, 
as a function, you can't have a y. So e must be 0. You understand what I'm saying? Okay. Can you repeat that? So, okay. Um, Is this true for all x? No. When is it true? Only when x is 0 or 2, right? Is this true for all x? Yeah, it's always true for any x. Okay. So this equality here is equality between functions. This one is only true for some values. Differential equation is about two sides being equal as functions, okay? So, so here, the left side is a function of x, and that has to be zero for all values of x as functions, okay? So, see, if I want this to be zero, you better not have this, because if, if there is this, mm -hmm. then it can't, it can't be this. I see. Okay, all right. So that d shouldn't be there, so I immediately say d shouldn't be there, d shouldn't be there, D shouldn't be there, E shouldn't be there, okay? So E shouldn't be there. So we have that, and I need this to be 4Y. What? 4. Oh, I messed up, sorry. This should, should have been X. This should be, have been Y. It doesn't make sense, right? So uh, it's a function of Y, so I better put Y here, function of X, okay? Why did I make that mistake? That's terrible. Okay. All right. But anyways, uh, so this should be 4x and this should be 8y. So here, here's my dilemma. Uh, for these two to equal as functions, f must be 0 because there's no constant term. And 2b must be 4, so b must be 2. For these two to be equal as functions, this has to be 0 and this must be B has to be 2. That it works out. Okay. Now, uh, are we able to satisfy all the boundary conditions? No, we can't, right? However, we can make the most out of it, okay? So what do you want the value of B to be? 2. You want B to be 2. What do you want F to be? You want, why, why, why not 2? Why do you want 0? You want to satisfy the first one. You have to satisfy the first one. Because it satisfies this, this, and this. Okay? But not this. Alright? So, if I choose F to be 0. In other words, we did all this work, but I saw that uh, if I just have UXY, so, so observe that, vxy equals to 2xy satisfies Laplacian equation and v of x0 equal to 0, v of x2 equals to 4x, and v of 4y equals to 8y. And the only problem is uh, the, the one that doesn't satisfy uh, is v of 0y. What's this value? What's v of 0y? If v is this, what's v of 0y? Zero. Zero, right. Okay. So pretty good. Mat matches three out of four. So what do you do? What do you want to do with this? What should we do? Same trick as before. What do we do? Find the complement that satisfy uh, the right. third so, line. So we, you say uh, let w oh. x y be u x y minus b x y. Right. Then what happens? Then uh, this will be zero. 
Okay? Because they, they both satisfy the Laplace equation. And you have W x 0 as 0, W x 2 as 0, because 4x minus 4x will be 0, right? W 0y is no, uh, is no good. It's a 2 minus 0, so you still need it to be 2. Okay? And then W of 4y would be 0. Hey, that's nice. So now you just have to solve this one question by separation of variables. So now let's do, do that. How did you get two? Uh, because uh, w is u minus v, right? What is u of 0y? It's 2, right? What's v of 0y? It's 0. So what's 2 minus 0? 2. So you get 2, OK? All right. So now let's try to solve this one. And at the end of the day, you just add this to this, done. Okay. All right, so let's try. Uh, What's step one? What's step one of separation of variables? Yes. Okay. And you plug it into this equation here so that x double prime x y of y plus x x y low prime of y equals to 0. Move this to the other side, so you have x double prime of x, y of y equals to negative x of x, y double prime of y. And then uh, you divide both sides by x, y. Which, after canceling, you end up with x double prime of x over x of x equals to y double prime of y equals to y of y. And you make this argument that uh, since the left side doesn't change when you change y, when the right side, and, and since the right side doesn't change when you change x, this shouldn't change at all even when you change the values of x or y, right? And, and that means it must equal to a constant. I forgot a minus, sorry. It has to equal to a constant. Okay? Oh, uh, however, there's, a, there's one, one difference between what we did on Monday and here. Uh, mm -hmm. We don't want to name this as negative lambda. We want to name this as lambda. Why? Why the difference? Well, look, look at the boundary conditions. Uh, we only need the ones with zeros, right? Because we can't, this, this type of solution cannot satisfy all of them. We can only satisfy the ones with zeros, okay? Mm -hmm. So uh, we have uh, x of x, y of 0 equals to 0. x of x, y of 2 equals to 0. And then x of 4 y of uh, y equals to 0, right? It's 0, 0, 0. Okay. So, so this one's missing. Okay. So all I did was I, I just plugged in x0, x2, and 4y, and set them equal to 0, because that's, th those are the, the three conditions where you get 0. Okay. And uh, because I need w to be non-trivial, W cannot be a zero solution. Uh, and uh, if these are zero, then that happens. So you don't want these to be zero. You, would, you need these to be zero. So you end up with y of zero equals to zero, y of two equals to zero, and x of four equals to zero. Okay. Now, if you look at this, what do you see that's somewhat different from our Monday's lecture? On Monday, we had x of 0 and x of 4, right? Mm -hmm. Here, what do you see? Y of 0 and y of 2, right? Mm -hmm. So that's why we need it to be lambda, because if you put it as lambda, here's what you get. You get x double prime minus lambda x equals to 0 
and y double prime plus lambda y equals to zero. And this is the form of the, the, the sturm liouville You want this to be plus. And why do I want the, the sturm liouville to be on the y side? Because y has two endpoints. Uh, if you only have one condition, that's not sturm liouville You need two conditions to be sturm liouville okay? When you have two, two conditions, you, you want it to be plus because uh, that's in accordance with uh, the operator that we're looking with. We're really looking at the eigenvalues of this negative second derivative operator. So if you move this to the other side, that's the operator that's involved. And we're looking, really looking at the eigenvalues of this, this operator. Okay? So that's why this has to be plus. Okay, that's the, the, the gist of the starting level. Okay? So that's what we have. And then, uh, now we've done sturm liouville enough times to know that these two combined should say what? Y of Y should be what? Sine. Sine has to be sine, right? Sine of n pi over L, but L is 2, so it's 2 of Y. It's a function of y, so you have to put y, not x, okay? And then uh, you have lambda, which has to be n squared pi squared over 4, with n equals to 1, 2, 3, and so on and so on. And then you plug that into here, which gives you x double prime minus n squared pi squared over 4x equal to 0. And notice that our condition is that x of 4 is equal to 0. Okay? Uh, so I, I, I explained that while, uh, see, see, the only difference between this one and this one is that one is plus and the other is minus. Uh, that, that's, that has the effect of uh, rotation by i in the uh, function. So, so if you solve this, the characteristic equation has i in there. This one doesn't have the i. That's the difference. And th that difference translates to this one being solution being cosine and sine, whereas this one being what? The hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine, right? Okay. So you want to write the solution of this as hyperbolic cosine and hyperbolic sine rather than e to something. Uh, that makes the calculation easier. But here's another trick that people use to, to simplify things. If you just go by cosine hyperbolic of x and sine hyperbolic of x, then this condition is hard to use. You want to use something that would make one of them just quickly zero. So instead of saying x is equal to c1 of cosine hyperbolic of n pi over 2x plus c2 of sine hyperbolic of n pi over 2, 2x. This would be not so pleasant if you plug in 4 here. If you plug in 4, none of these become 0. And if it doesn't become 0, you get some equation for c1 and c2, and you don't know what to do with them. The numbers become crazy, okay? So uh, that, that's what I was talking about when I said uh, uh, when you have the, the value at 0, it's slightly different from the case when you get, you get values at 4 okay? or, or the other one. So these two are easier than these two. Okay? If you have non-zero here or there, that, that's slightly harder. And it's exactly this point. Not too much, just a little bit harder, okay? So what do you do? Well, uh, you just... <coughs> If this is a solution, then any horizontal translation of that function will still satisfy the differential equation. Do you agree? Yeah. If uh, I don't know how to explain that. Yeah. It's uh, see, all you want is that second derivative of this is it minus n squared pi squared over four of itself should be zero. Uh, that relationship shouldn't change if you just put L x minus something. Because when you do the chain rule, only these numbers play out. That, that minus something, that doesn't do anything. Do, do you agree? Yes. All right. So what I want to do is I want to subtract something. But what do I want to subtract? 
What do you think? Minus what? Four. Why four? Because now when you plug in four, what happens here? Zero. Zero, right? So x of four would make this one zero and only give you c one because cos cosh of zero is one. Sinh, you just call it sinh, okay? Sinh of zero is zero. Cosh of zero is one, so you just get c one times one, and that has to equal to zero. So that immediately kills off the c one, right? C, because c one is zero, so you get x equals to just sinh of this thing, okay? All right, so. We did the hard work, now let's come back and write the result of the step one. Here is what we just found out in step one. We found out that this has to be, this has to be, uh, for the x it has to be some constant times sinh of n pi over two x minus four Whereas for the y, it has to be sine of n pi over 2y. So that's what we found so far. What do you do with these? How many solutions did we find? How many did we find? No, infinitely many. Why? Because this is a solution for n equals to 1, 2, 3, 4, 5. Um, there are infinitely many. Okay? Yeah. What do you do with them? Summation. Summation, yeah. So in a fancy word that uh, physicists like to use, they call it superposition of solutions. Right? Mathematicians just say linear combination. If you take the linear combination of solutions that satisfy this, 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 and this, excluding this one, any sum of those will still satisfy the three things. Okay, it still satisfies. Okay, so so what you do is now you promote this into a series and say in general this n from one through infinity of c n sinh n pi over two x minus four times sine n pi over two y is going to satisfy the three conditions. Okay. And we're almost there. Uh, we still have some bit of calculation left, but not too much. So I, I'm erasing this part, but please remember that, that you're, you're shifting this uh, x minus some number so that the calculation becomes easier. Uh, you, can, you can still write down the solution without it, but if you do, then it, it won't be pleasant reading it. So. It's a lot easier if you do it that way, okay? All right, so we have that, and then uh, now let's try to satisfy this one remaining thing. This is the only thing that we, we couldn't make work, but now we can make it to work because we can take this and plug in 0 into x, and because w0y is 2, we can say 2 is equal to w0y equals to summation of n equals to 1 to infinity of cn, and then sinh, if you plug in 0 into x, you get n pi over 2 times negative 4, and sine of n pi over 2y. So what you want is the following. 2 is equal to, by the way, uh, I, I said that uh, cosh and sinh are like the even and odd parts of the exponential function, right? So which one is this one? Is it even or odd? Odd. Sine is odd, so it must be the sinh that's odd, right? Mm -hmm. So this is an odd function, so a minus can be brought outside. Odd functions can do that, right? So I can bring the minus outside, summation, n equals to 1 through infinity of cn sinh, of 2 n pi because uh, 4 divided by 2 is 2 minus is brought outside because sine hyperbolic is odd. Okay. And uh, this, this looks 
it's really tempting to say, isn't this zero? But it's not. It's sin of n pi is not zero. Okay, don't do that. Only sine of n pi is zero. Okay. And you have sine of n pi over 2 y. Okay. So this means, uh, what do we want to do? What do you want to do? Huh? Yeah, how do we make this work? See, this, this all, although this looks scary, this is a number for each n. Okay? For, if you give me a number, for n equals to 1, this 2 times 1 times 3.14, you plug into sine h, you, you can use a calculator to get a number, right? So that's a number, that's a number, times a function. Okay? So what's the function here? Sine, right? Sine is a function, okay? So what kind of series is, is this one? Fourier sine series, right? So we want to take the Fourier sine series of two. Okay. So we, we take Fourier sine series whose formula is Bn equals to two over L, zero to L f of x sine of n pi over L x dx. Now we have to modify this formula somewhat because uh, oh, I already changed because uh, here it's a function of y, not x, so we have to change it to y. And our l is 2, because it's n pi over 2. So that, that's l, okay? So we have 2 over 2, 0 to 2, f of x is 2, sine of n pi over 2, x dx. That's just 1, 2 can be brought outside, so it's 2. Taking the antiderivative, that's 2 over n pi with a minus sign, cosine n pi over 2, x, plug in 2 and 0. So uh, minus 2 times 2, that's negative 4 pi, 4 over n pi. And now we just have to think about what, go, what happens to this one when you plug in 2 and there, 0. So first, when you plug in 2, what happens? Cosine n pi, what's that? Negative 1 to the nth power. power, right? So you get negative 1 to the nth power. When you plug in 0, what happens? Cosine of 0 is 1, right? And you're subtracting them. You plug this and you plug this and you subtract. So you subtract. Okay, so that's your Bn. Oh, but not yet. This means that 2 is equal to summation of n equals to 1 through infinity of negative 4 over n pi of negative 1 to the nth power minus 1 sine of n pi over 2y. Oh, I forgot to change to y. I, I said it, but I didn't. But it's, it's at, the end the same, at, at, the end of the, at the end of the day, it's the same thing, right? Uh, whether you integrate by x or y, it doesn't matter, okay? So this is what you have. Okay, is it good so far? Mm -hmm. All right. Or maybe, maybe I should change this to y, just to satisfy you folks. Oh, uh, this one's okay, this one's the original one, but I should change this one as y. Mm -hmm. Okay, right. then everything's good, okay. All right, so this is what we have now. Try to compare this one with this one and tell me what parts correspond. So my question is, which part on that side corresponds to this one? It's this one with this one. That's how they correspond, right? So now we can almost finish uh, by saying uh, I'm running out of room, so let's just delete here. We're almost done. So what is Cn? Cn would be, uh, let's write, write, write the full thing and then think. Okay, so negative Cn of sinh 2n pi should equal to negative 4 over n pi, negative 1 to the nth power minus 1. Right? Okay, so now what? Divide both sides by sinh of 2n pi. My n and h look so similar. Okay, you divide both sides by negative sinh 2n pi. 
And by the way, sinh to n pi is never zero. Sinh function is only zero at zero. Otherwise, it's never zero. So this is gone. So, so this is gone. That's gone. So you get cn as 4 over n pi sinh 2n pi and then negative 1 to the nth power minus 1. That's your cn. Okay. And therefore, what do you do? With, where does this go? It's now so complicated. You may for, have forgotten where that goes. We're trying to find w, right? So what is w? w x y is what? Where does that go? C a summation. Right here. Right here. Yeah. Yeah. Summation n equals to one through infinity of uh, four over n pi sinh. 2n pi of negative 1 to the nth power minus 1. All right. Oh, and then I still have to copy off the other one. Sinh of n pi over 2, x minus 4. Delete all this. Times a sine of n pi over 2y. Okay, are we done? Well, you have to add the V. Yeah. <laughs> You're still not done, okay? Yeah. You have to change your expectations, I said, right? Uh, see, what is U? You're, we're looking for UXY, right? You have to add this to the other side. So UXY is VXY plus WXY. So the grand finale of Today's work is, I'm so tempted to just, just do this, but I guess I, I should be, I should write it, right? I should be a good boy and take time to write it because you're taking notes. All right, so you have uh, UXY, oh, to congratulate ourselves, we should put big letters, answer, okay. Answer, UXY must be, 2xy plus summation of n equals to 1 through infinity of 4 over n pi sine hyperbolic of 2n pi, okay, and then negative 1 to the nth power minus 1. times a sine hyperbolic of n pi over 2x minus 4 sine of n pi over 2y. That's it. That's the solution. Okay? That's the solution of this Laplace PD. Yeah, I feel like exam one could be just one question. Okay. <laughs> one hour. Right? Okay. But it will be more. So you're expected to solve this in 10 minutes. No, I'm kidding. But, but at like 30 minutes. Yeah. 30 minutes. You have to, you have to do it quickly. Okay. All right. So where do we go from here? Okay. Now, uh, yeah, so, so more warning is that still more terrible differential equations await, and uh, it will be even harder. Yeah. So I, I, I'll have to do just a little bit of taste before it gets too hard uh, before the final. So uh, let's try to do Laplace PDE in circular domain, uh, or on a disk. I guess that's better. So. On a disk. All right, can I erase this? Are you done writing? Sure. Okay. Okay, Laplace PD on a disk. So imagine that uh, you have a disk of radius, say,
say six. Ooh, just try six. And on one side, you have you put some positively charged stuff. On the other side, you put some negatively charged metal. And th those metal are really thin. You can neglect its size. And uh, these two sides are not touching each other so that uh, electrons can't go from jump from one to the other. Um, but let's just say that uh, you're doing this so that on this side, it's negative one volt all around, and on this side, it's plus one volt all around. And uh, our uh, interest is knowing the uh, voltage distribution inside. Okay. So what, what is the voltage function inside? Question. Uh, voltage function. So uh, I think voltage is called electric potential. Uh, not electric potential energy, but electric potential. So you want to know the potential function uh, inside. Okay. And notice that inside here, there's no charge. And uh, because of that, and, and it doesn't have to be a disk, it could be just empty, uh, it could be a, a vacuum space. Still, uh, because you have voltage here and voltage there, there will be some electric field here and there will be a potential function there, okay? All right. Uh, and uh, I explained that uh, such an equation, uh, such a, a Potential function satisfies the Laplace equation. Uh, but the difference here is that this time you have, uh, you need u to be a function of r and theta. Okay, so so you need u, u as a function of r and theta. Okay. So that uh, u of uh, 6 comma theta would be 1 for theta between 0 to pi, okay. and then u of uh, 6 comma theta would be negative 1 for theta between negative pi to 0. That's what we want. And uh, the question is, how, how do we solve this? Now, the immediate problem that we face if we do that is because uh, it's, it's due to the fact that we only know Laplacian as second derivative in x and second derivative in y. Okay. But this has to be converted into the polar form. Uh, but that was our, our uh, homework in the first day, right? After the first day, I gave you homework, which was to watch this video that where I do this calculation, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I think most of you did well. So uh, it, if you write this in polar, it's 1 over r squared, uh, second derivative in r, plus 1 over r, first derivative in r. Oops. Oh, I got it backwards. Uh, yeah, this is the one. Okay. So, so, uh, they, see, the, the reason I remember this is because the, the units must match. See, what, what is this? This is like second derivative in R, right? So r is downstairs. So what's the unit of this? Negative length, uh, length negative two squared. 
negative squared, right? Because that it's r is the length, so the unit for this is length negative two. How about this one? This is le length of negative one, so in order to, to for these two to have the same dimension, this better be divided by r, right? And this one, there's no th theta has no unit, by the way. Angles are ratios of lengths, so it has zero as the unit, l to the zero as the unit, so you really need an r squared. Okay, Th that's how I remember. Now, uh, how about the actual fact that wh why does this exist? Well, you just have to do the calculation. I, uh, I don't have uh, any intuition be beyond that, unfortunately. Maybe there's something, but uh, unfortunately, I, I don't have any intuition. Uh, yeah, I, I do know that uh, it can't be just these two. It has to be, there has to be something here because uh, as on the plane, as you go further up, uh, you're, you're not measuring. Ah, I, I give up. I can't, I can't really come up with a good good explanation. I should, I should think about this more. Okay. All right. But uh, anyways, uh, so this is true and uh, there's a video that, that I do. Uh, so if you, if you for, didn't fully get how I do this, uh, please follow my YouTube channel. By the way, uh, everyone is subscribing to my channel, right? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Right. And then uh, press like on that video if you can. Yeah. And then, uh, yeah, so then you, we're going to accept that that's true. Okay. All right, so now we have the following uh, equation. We have uh, boundary RR of U plus 1 over R, boundary R of U plus 1 over R squared, boundary theta theta of U equals to 0, and then U of 6 theta equals to 1 for 0 between uh, pi u of 6 theta equals to negative 1, or theta between negative pi to 0. And then, uh, in addition, uh, there's, a, there's a problem with just having this, because if you think about it, this, in terms of theta, it has to be a periodic function, right? So I'm really thinking of this I'm really thinking of this as valid for uh, r between 0 to 6 and theta between negative pi to pi. But uh, as, you, as you go around and you cross, the function should be repeating. It has to be periodic, right? So we, we need to add some condition here, which is that if you have uh, u of uh, any r at pi that has to equal to u of any r at negative pi. So uh, when you cross over from negative pi to positive, no, sorry, so here, here, uh, not there. Okay, sorry. So when you when you so so the values are given here to there, right? So when you cross over from positive pi to negative pi and you go, go round and round, they have to ha match their values, or else it's not physical. It, I mean, you, you would have believed if somebody told you that the solution of such a thing has a jump discontinuity here. It doesn't make sense, right? So this better be it. And not only that, they should be uh, going smoothly. You can't have like a sudden sharp turn, right? So their derivatives has to match as well. So you need u. Um, theta r pi equals to u theta r negative pi. So if you, if you differentiate in the th theta direction, their, their slope should match. Now, it, it's even true that higher derivatives after this should also match, like uh, theta double prime. But it turns out that these two are going to provide us the two conditions necessary for the stern Liouville. So that's all we need. Okay. So we, we all, if you just have this one, it's not going to be sufficient. We can't solve the stern Liouville. But if you have both, then you, we have the two conditions necessary for stern Liouville. Okay. All right. So let's let's now, since we now have the full 
differential equation presented to us. Now let's try to solve this, okay? So uh, again, step one. What's step one? U R theta is? <coughs> X, no, it's um, some R R. R R. Theta. Theta. Yeah. And then you plug it in here so that you get end up with R double prime of R oh, times theta, theta, theta plus 1 over R, uh, R prime of R theta, theta, and then plus 1 over R squared, uh, R, R theta double prime of theta equal to 0. Okay. Uh, what we want to do is we want to move this to the other side and then divide by r theta. Okay. So we'll have enough room, so I should better use this part. r double prime of r theta theta plus 1 over r, r prime r theta theta equals to negative 1 over r squared r r uh, theta double prime of theta and then we are going to divide both sides by r r theta theta r r theta theta and uh, there's something that you may notice that uh, you see uh, as uh, worrisome because, see, even if you cancel the r away, there's still this, this r squared, right? Mm -hmm. And that's not good because separation of variables means we have to separate the r and theta. So r should be only on one side and theta should be on the other side. So we have to get rid of this as well. So we're going to divide by 1 over r squared as well. Okay? So we divide both sides by 1 over r squared. And that gives us, let's see, that gives us uh, thetas cancel away, and you get r squared r double prime of r plus r times r prime of r over r of r. Uh, that's because I multiplied r squared top and bottom. I canceled out the theta theta, so that, that's what we have. On the right side, I have negative theta double prime of theta over theta. Okay. And again, same logic applies. Left is a function of r only. Right is a function of theta only. Left doesn't change when you change theta. The right doesn't change when you change r. That means for them to be equal, it shouldn't be changing when you change the r or theta, which means it has to be a constant function. Okay. And uh, uh, now let's also work on these conditions. Uh, this one actually looks like an a initial value, so we're not going to be working on this one. Rather, we will only be working on this one. Okay. So uh, in, in step one, we're not going to work on this one, but we are going to work with the Laplace and these two boundary conditions. Okay, so let's see what that means. This is um, r of r theta of pi equals to r of r theta of negative pi. And this is r of r theta prime of pi equals to r of r theta prime of negative pi. And uh, Again, uh, because we don't want trivial solutions, these cannot be zero so, zero, so we can just divide both sides by r, r. These can be canceled. So you see that the two conditions are given for theta. Okay? So which one do we need the sturm yobel for? We need the, the one for theta. Okay? So, so if we want the, the sturm yobel for theta, we should make this as what? Lambda or negative lambda? 
land that. Good. So here, here's the term you will study different, so we can't really say it uh, easily. So uh, if I multiply this to the right side and you move this to the other side, then you get 0 equals to theta double prime of theta plus lambda times theta of theta, which is the format for the Stern mutable, except the boundary conditions are slightly different. The boundary conditions are theta of pi has to equal to theta of negative pi, and theta prime of pi has to equal to theta prime of negative pi. Okay. Any, any questions so far? Because uh, this is going to take a little bit longer than the previous one. Any questions? All right. So I think you guys are following, so let's try this. Uh, for this term, we have to do two cases. First is when lambda is 0, right? and the other is when lambda is positive. And some books ask you to do lambda negative, but we don't do that because there's some theorem that says we don't have to do that, okay? So let's do the lambda equal to zero case. If lambda is zero, you get zero equals to theta double prime. Now for this one, you don't write the characteristic equation, you just simply integrate twice, okay? So you integrate twice, so you get, uh, integrate once, so you get a equals to theta prime. You integrate both sides by theta again, you get theta equals to a theta, small theta, plus b. This is big theta, this, oh, sorry, like this, okay. So that's what we have. Now for a pi plus b to equal to a times negative pi plus b, if you cancel the b both sides and solve for a, what do you get for a? A must be hmm? okay. Oh, you don't get it. Just move this to the other side. That's uh, negative eight pi. That's positive eight pi. Move it here. You get two eight pi equals to zero, right? So A must be zero, right? And by the way, theta prime is a constant function, so the second condition is all automatically met. Okay? So that means if A is 0, you have theta of theta being just B. Question, is this a non-trivial function? Yeah, it's a non-trivial. Anything that's not 0 is, is called a non-trivial solution. Okay? So that's a non-trivial solution. Does that mean lambda equal to 0 is an eigenvalue? Yes. Any, anytime you have a non-trivial solution, the corresponding value of lambda is called an eigenvalue. And one of the functions you choose out of this, this is like, it could be one or two or uh, 300 or anything, right? But just choose one as one representative of the, this entire solution. So we choose one and that would be called an eigenfunction, okay? So here we have one eigenfunction. Gee, I have a question right here, so I don't know where to write. Oh, let's just erase this as well. All right. So uh, we see that lambda equal to zero is an eigenvalue with uh, eigenfunction theta of theta being just one. Okay. Now, second case number two. Or number two, actually. Number two, lambda greater than zero. Okay. Now for that one, we've done it many times, so let me just skip right to the solution. It's uh, theta of theta, theta of theta must equal to uh, C1 cosine square root lambda theta plus C2 sine square root of lambda of theta, okay? So, so if, if lambda is positive, then this equation gives you cosine and sine, right? If, land, if, if there's a minus in front of lambda and still lambda is positive, then it gives you the cosine hyperbolic and sine hyperbolic that, that we just did, right? It's the same, same deal here, okay? So you're, go, you're going to get the sine and cosine because it's, it's plus, okay? 
this is plus, it's the cosine and sine. If this is minus, it's cosine hyperbolic and sine hyperbolic. Okay? So we have that. And then we plug in um, theta of pi, which is uh, C1 cosine of square root of lambda pi plus C2 sine square root of lambda pi. And that has to equal to theta of negative pi, right? So that's uh, C1 cosine of square root of lambda negative pi plus C2 sine square root of lambda negative pi. Okay. Now, uh, one of these are same, the other is negative of each other. Which one? Which one's the same and which one's the opposite? Cosine's the same. is the same because it's an even function, right? Whether you plug in minus or plus, it's the same. So we can just subtract both sides. So we can subtract cosine pi times square root lambda both sides so that c1. So, so c1. So, so they go away and this actually doubles. So the result is that 2c2 of sine square root lambda pi should be 0. Is that good? Because this, this minus comes out, and if you move it to the other side, it actually doubles. So what's your conclusion here? c2 is 0. Oh, I know. So, yeah, right. So C2 is 0 oh, okay. or sine. sine of square root of lambda pi is 0. Okay. Now, this one we know what happens. What happens? When does this happen? When square root of lambda pi is n pi. So that lambda is n squared. Oh, I'm running out of room. Uh, I really can't afford to delete this one. Uh, you know, I can delete this one. Okay. And let me delete this one. Uh, I have that, so I can delete this. All right. All right. Okay, but what if C2 is 0? C2 is 0, that that would make, so, uh, if not lambda equals to n squared, then we end up having C2 as 0, so theta of theta would be C1 cosine of square root of lambda theta, right? Because C2 is 0, that's just the theta. Now you plug in, now you differentiate theta, which gives you negative square root of lambda C1 cosine square root of lambda theta, uh, sine, sine. The derivative of the cosine is negative sine. Okay? And for this one, I need to plug in pi and negative pi. Plug in pi here, plug in, uh, plug in, uh, sorry, negative pi here. So, so this one here is theta prime negative pi, and this one here is theta prime positive pi. Uh, but then again, uh, minus minus cancel, so it's plus, and then if you bring this to the other side, you get the same equation. Zero equals to two square root of lambda c one sine square root of lambda uh, pi. But already, already c two is zero. So this one is saying that c two is zero. 
So we can't afford to have C1 at zero, right? If C1 is also zero with C2 zero, what does that mean? We get a trivial solution for theta. We can't afford that, okay? We're looking for non-trivial solutions. So that means this is, again, forced to be zero. Sine of square root of lambda pi has to be zero. So again, uh, this has to be zero. So again, your lambda must be n squared. So uh, you try to avoid getting this, but you, you get to the same point anyway. Okay. Uh, so you, you do see that uh, you need both conditions. Uh, so just having this one wouldn't be sufficing, the, uh, forcing the lambda to be n squared. Only when you have both of these, uh, you get a value for lambda, which says lambda should be n squared. Okay. Okay. So that's that's what we have. So after all this work, let's summarize the answer for theta, okay? We, we did so much work, but here's what we have. So uh, theta of theta is either uh, some constant times cosine of n theta plus c2 times sine of n theta with lambda being n squared, n equals to 1, 2, 3. And here I really can't take one representative because just I may be able to choose one of them, but it's not a good idea. If, uh, see, the, these are not multiples of each other because you have two degrees of freedom. Uh, so I'll, I'll just leave it like that. Although I don't like the coefficients, but I don't have any choice. And also, uh, also theta of theta being 1, with lambda equal to zero is eigenvalue, an eigenfunction, okay? I have a question. Yes. Can you remind us how you determined that the eigenvalue is equivalent to n squared? Oh, uh, here, here. Yeah, I see it in both places, right? I see it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, so when is sine zero? Sine of zero is n pi. n pi. So you, you say square root of lambda pi goes to n pi. Mm -hmm. Divide both sides by pi. And square both sides, you get lambda equal to n squared. I understand that yeah. part. It's just like, um, is, is that um, why the overall reason why lambda is equal to n pi? I mean, n squared? So, so uh, it's either lambda equal to n squared or lambda equal to n squared. Therefore, lambda is n squared. Logic is uh, so. a little strange, but that's why they did. You try to avoid this, but you have no way around it. The I second see. condition forces it. All right, so that's that's what you have. Okay, so you found theta. Now we still have to figure out r, right? So let's try to go for r. Plug in. So there are two cases. For r equal to zero, what do we have? Uh, so when lambda equal to zero, you have r squared capital R double prime of R plus R of R prime of R over R of R equals to zero. Well, that's when lambda is zero. Okay. So move that to the other side and then uh, you have R squared R double prime of R plus R of R prime of R equal to zero. Divide both sides by R. Because you can't, you can further simplify. Uh, this is actually, although this is second order differential equation, you can view this as a first order differential equation because why? You just treat r prime as y, and this would be y prime. This is a first order linear differential equation. So, so it's even separable. You can solve it as a first order separable. But here's a faster way. Uh, doesn't this look like a product rule to you? Yes? Can you see the product rule? It's a prime of what? Oh, it's a prime of R R. Right? 
if you apply the product rule to this one, when this one gets differentiated, you get that. When this one gets differentiated, you get that. Yes. You see the product rule? Okay. Yeah, because the product rule is uh, you just differentiate one, keep the other unchanged. Yeah. You differentiate the other and keep the first one unchanged. So the product rule will give you both. Okay. So then you can integrate both sides, which says that r of r prime of r must be some constant. Divide by r, and then you integrate, you get r of r as, what's integral of 1 over r? Ln. Ln of r, right? So c ln of r. You don't need to put absolute value because r is always 0 or positive, right? Yeah. Uh, in polar coordinates, r is always positive plus another constant of integration, so you put d. What's log of 0? Negative infinity. Negative infinity. So that's not physical. Okay. Uh, so uh, here, here we do need some physical arguments here. Uh, Whatever the solution is, it has to be some smooth function inside. Only on the boundary you have like a positive one and some jump to negative one. Interior of the disk must be a smooth function. And I'll explain why. There are some nice theorems about uh, harmonic functions that we will go over that will explain just that, okay? So uh, since, so maybe, okay, maybe I should write here. So we see that uh, since limit of r going to 0, r going to 0 of ln of r is negative infinity, this solution is not physical. Hence, and actually, not just physical, it's not even mathematical. There, there are reasons, but we didn't go over the mean value theorem yet, uh, so we're going to get there. Okay? So hence, uh, we have, uh, what do I want to say, hence uh, c must be 0, so that r of theta, no, r of r, it's just a constant. So that's nice. Uh, when lambda is 0, both theta and r must be a constant. So this means that when lambda is 0, uh, your u, r theta, is just a constant times a constant. So just some constant. Okay. Now, second case, when lambda is n squared, that's positive. That's, that's harder because now you have r of theta as well. So you have r squared, r of r, plus, sorry, this should be second derivative, r of r, 1 prime over r of r equals to n squared. And you can multiply r of r both sides and subtract. You have r squared r double prime r plus r of r prime r. Multiply this to the other side and you subtract. So it's minus n squared r of r. So this is a second order, and uh, unfortunately, this is an equation uh, you did not solve in the uh, Calculus 4 class here. Uh, I've taught the ODE course years before, but I don't recall ever dealing with such a thing in that class. So this is something that you've never seen. Okay? I mean, uh, uh, 
before I was like joking about how you forgot everything you learned in ODE, but here you didn't, you really didn't know. Okay? You really don't know this, okay? Uh, however, there's, there's one interesting point here, is that you have two derivatives and you're multiplying by r squared. You have one derivative, you're multiplying by r, and no derivative is just a constant, right? So, uh, I think this is called Euler equation or something when that happens, when, when uh, you have, right, if the number of derivatives match with the powers of r, or, or if the number of the derivatives match with the powers of x, if it's a different equation than x, then uh, you can use the following onsets. Just set r of r as r to the nth power. Oh, not, not that. We already have that, that n is something. So let's, let's use this as a k. What's the condition again? Uh, if if uh, one derivative times r, two derivative times r squared, no derivative, no r, it's r to zero power. If that happens, then, then that's the answer. Okay. It's, I think it's called Euler. I can't be sure. Uh, I think it's called the Euler equation. Uh, all right, so so you, you you plug that in, and then let's see what happens. Uh, if I plug that in, it's r squared. Uh, what what's what's the second derivative of r k? One derivative k comes down. If you differentiate again, what comes down? K minus one, yes. And then r to what power? K minus 2, okay, plus R times, what's the one derivative? If you just differentiate, what do you get? K, R to the, K minus 1, good. And then minus N squared, R to the K, equal to 0. Okay, and uh, see, r squared k minus 2 becomes r to the k. r times r to the k minus 1 also becomes r to the k. This is r to the k, and this is why it works. Everything would be uh, have, a, have the factor of r to the k, which you can factor out. So if you factor out, here's what happens. You just get k times k minus 1 plus k minus n squared. Do you agree? After factoring out the r to the k. And then that's k squared minus k plus k cancels, and you just get this. Uh, again, uh, equa equation in differential equation is usually, in most cases, equation between functions. So the left side and right side should be equal as functions of r. Okay. For any value of r, this should be equal. For that to happen, what must happen? k squared plus n squared. Yeah, that has to be 0. Okay. So we, we have k squared minus n squared equal to 0, so that k must be plus or minus n. So how many solutions did we obtain? Infinite. Huh? Infinite. No. Hmm? Oh, yeah, okay, okay. For, an, okay. for, for a fixed value of n, how oh, many fixed. solutions? Two. Two. Two, right? So uh, you get r of r as one solution will be r to the nth power. The other solution will be r to the negative nth power. You put c1, c2. Take the linear combination. Take the superposition of the two solutions. That's, that's the solution in general. Now, which one do you do not like? Which one is the one we don't like? Hmm? Why? Why? Why do we not like this one? Because it's n goes to infinity, it's zero. Huh? No, n is not zero. n is always positive. What could be zero? R. R could be zero. That's the problem. This is 1 over r to the nth power, right? So if you send r to zero, this goes to infinity. So that's not physical. So that, that's bad. 
All right. Uh, so, okay. <laughs> I'm running against time here. Uh, we're still, uh, but but it's, it's, it's almost, we're, we're almost there. Just, just a little bit more, okay? All right, so um, where are we now? Uh, we have, uh, yeah, so we have theta and r. So here, here's what we have. In general, uh, u r theta, so in general, let's just write down the general solution, okay, since we found all the, the parts, okay. So when lambda is zero, it's just a constant, so I'll just put it as c zero, okay. So that, that's the one that corresponds to lambda equal to zero, okay. And then plus summation of n from 1 through infinity. And uh, here, here's what's happening. You have uh, c1. So, so you have this function right here times this one, right? Those two things are multiplied with some constant multiple. So if I multiply them separately, I have this times this and this times this. Those are the two kinds of solutions that goes inside the square, uh, the summation. So it's, uh, I, I really need to put different letters now. Uh, I'll, I'll just capital, okay? Yeah. I always want to use the capitals uh, when, when I have two of them because it's confusing with the, the Fourier series formulas. And so I'm going to put a n r to the n cosine, oh, yeah, r to the n cosine n theta plus b n r to the n sine n theta. So that, that's the general solution. Uh, where do we go from here? I need to constantly ask you because uh, it, it's so easy to get lost. Yeah. Check the conditions. The Fourier series, yes. What conditions should we satisfy? Uh, the u six. The these two, right? Yeah. yeah. The, these endpoint conditions. So these should give you the Fourier series. Okay. So um, here's what we're gonna do. We're just going to define f of theta to be 1 when theta is between 0 to pi and negative 1 when theta is between negative pi to 0, like that, okay? So that we can write this as a single equation. You can just write it as u of 6 theta is equal to f of theta. Pretty fancy, right? Uh, however, we actually know a, a bit more about this function. Um, what's the graph of this function? Can you think about it? On the right side, what do you get? What do you get on this right side? Is it this or this? <laughs> I'm just asking. Come on, you. All right, yeah. I, I think uh, you guys are really shy. Perhaps it's being recorded, that's why. Okay. All right, what about the left side? Negative one. Negative one, right? So negative one, positive one. Here's pi, negative pi. So we have that, right? And I really didn't give you the value for here, but that's okay because it's a. It's, uh, uh, we're doing integrals, so for integration, missing a point, that's nothing. But integration is about area. Uh, taking a point away doesn't do anything. Okay, uh, so what kind of function is this? First, even or odd? It's uh, odd. Odd. It's an odd function. And it's, it's one on this side, negative one on that side. Okay. So it's... it's, it's not that bad. It, it's like a signal function. Uh, yeah, it's, it's called step function or, you know, usually the unit step function is when you have zero and then one. That's called heavy sign function. Yeah, we're going to use this function tomorrow. Uh, but 
that's a slightly different. Okay, uh, so that, that's, that's the function. And then, because u of 6 theta, according to the formula on that side, is c0 plus summation of a n. So let's erase this. And r, oh, r is 6, so 6 to the nth power cosine n theta plus uh, bn 6 to the nth power sine n theta that's this so you have to let this equal to f of theta so what is that? what kind of series is, is this side? Fourier Series. It's not neither side or cosine is both, right? It's pretty a series. Hmm. What's the interval? From negative, negative pi to positive pi, right? Oh. Uh, by the way, this is not the only way to put the same condition. I could have used theta to be 0 to 2 pi, right? Uh, but I purposely made it to from, from negative pi to pi because I wanted to use a free series and our formula is for negative pi to pi. There are free series formula when you, when you have 0 to 2 pi, but it's, it's slightly hard to use. And plus, uh, you can't use an even and odd for that case, so that's why I prefer this. Okay. Now, since f theta is odd, immediately a lot of these are 0. Which ones? Since f theta is odd, What are zeros? C0. Yeah, so a0 in the formula and a n r0. Okay, so that's going to save us some time, okay? Thankfully, okay? All right, so we have, uh, that means our f of theta, uh, for f of theta, we just need bn. bn is one over L integral from negative L to L of f of theta sine of n pi over l theta d theta. See how I'm, I'm, rather than writing x, I'm using theta, okay? And because we have from negative pi to pi, this will be 1 over pi. And because this is odd, and that's also odd, you can use this trick of doubling the integral, so twice from 0 to pi of f theta sine L is pi, so pi over pi is 1, so you get n theta d theta. Okay. So that's your bn. Yes? I, I meant to ask this earlier, but it's, um, when is it it's not okay to double the interval? Uh, it's only okay if... So if oh, okay, that's a good question because we, we do this a lot and then some of you totally misunderstood what I was doing. Uh, the only time you can double the interval, you have to to uh, have two conditions met. First, the integration itself should begin with negative L to L. It has to be pure, it's symmetric with respect to zero. Some integrals start with zero to L. In that case, you can't double. Never do that, okay? So, to work with, to, to, so be careful, don't do that, okay? And then, uh, the second is that the thing that you're integrating should be an even function. And that's something that you have to think about. So f is an odd function, sine is an odd function, odd times odd is what? Even. Even. Okay? So that's why you can double. Okay? If those two conditions are met, you can double. Okay? Now, uh, however, between 0 to pi, f theta has a very easy, for easy formula. What is it? What's f theta? It's 1, right? This is 1. So all we have to do is just integrate sine, which is cos negative cosine, and on n goes down, so it's negative 2 over n pi cosine n theta, and you plug in pi and 0. And you plug in pi, cosine n pi, that's negative 1 to the nth power, so it's negative 2 over n pi, negative 1 to the nth power, and then when you plug in 0, it's 1, so you subtract 1. 
Okay. Uh, so now, what does that mean? That means this C0 will be 0, because that corresponds to A0. AN should also be 0. However, what is BN? So you have to think about where does this fit in this series? That goes in front of the sign, right? So what does that match with? Or should, should I write down the Fourier series? Uh, I, don't, I don't have any place to write, that's the problem, see. Fourier series is that f of theta is equal to negative two, no, summation of n from one through infinity of uh, negative two over n pi, negative one to the nth power minus one, sine of n theta. Okay. So that, that's the result of the Fourier series. If I take the Fourier series of this f theta, that's what we get. Because all the a0 and an's disappear, that's all we get. Now we compare this with this. What do we get? Which one corresponds to that one? Which one corresponds to this blue one? Huh? Is it just bn? Times? times? Six, to Six to the n, this much. Okay. So bn, right? But because both of them are in front of sine and theta, right? So you have to think think of them both. So bn must be uh, small bn over six to the nth power, so that this must be negative two over n pi six to the nth power negative one to the nth power minus one. Okay. Uh, and now I'm lost. What do we do? <laughs> what do we do? What is the final answer? Final, final answer. So we can all go home. Yeah. I'm actually amazed that I was able to pull this off in time. All right. Yeah. And I'm going to expect you to do it in time in, in the exam. So that's horrible. Right? Okay. U R theta is, what is it? This is u, right? This is u. We found c0 is 0, an is 0, so the only thing is this one. So we have summation n from 1 through infinity of negative 2 over n pi 6 to the nth power, negative 1 to the nth power, minus 1, and then uh, r to the nth power, sine and theta. I guess it's uh, about halfway of the class, so you guys are, are too much into this class already. If you're regretting taking this over the summer, <laughs> sorry for you. Okay. All right, that's all for today. I'll see you tomorrow.